is one of those songs we sang just a few minutes ago, I Will Rise. A tremendous song, We Will Rise Again, because Christ has risen from the dead. So don't be surprised if that's one of the requests at my funeral. You will be surprised at the other one. That's one song. The other one is Jesus Freak by DC Talk. It'll probably be the only funeral you've ever been to where that kind of song was sung. If I can, if I can get someone to do that at my funeral. <laughs> but hopefully that'll be a long ways off in the future, right? Not too many amens on that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> Well, I, I want to encourage you to, to come out to the Spaghetti Dinner Fundraiser if you can. Um, it's a good way of helping the teens and enjoying some time together uh, as well as helping uh, them to raise funds for their camp. And so again, that's this Saturday. And if you didn't fill, in one of the, fill out one of those slips, try to do that before you leave today. Also, if you haven't signed up for a connect group for one of the small groups, and, and the, the small groups aren't meant to add more to your schedule. Um, some of you are already coming Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. You're, uh, some, some guys are coming Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night, and Monday night to the men's Bible study. It's not meant to add more to it. It's, to, it's meant to provide an opportunity for those of you that may not be involved in some of those things and you'd like to get together with a group in somebody's home uh, for Bible study and, and uh, to get to know each other for fellowship and for prayer and uh, mutual encouragement. So consider uh, joining one of those small groups. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study in the book of Galatians, a tremendous, tremendous epistle of Paul to some of the churches of Asia Minor. This morning we're in chapter 3, chapter 3 of Galatians, and I'd like to read through verses 10 through 25, if you would follow along with me, please. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 25. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. God's, or excuse me, brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is, this, is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God, in His grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of our transgressions, until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. The mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. It is the law, therefore, is the law, therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would have certainly come by the law. But the scripture declares the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And again, we recognize uh, this morning that although men wrote it, they didn't write it under their own compulsion. It wasn't simply their own ideas, their own theology, their own religious beliefs. But that your Holy Spirit moved these men in such a manner 
that they wrote exactly what you wanted them to write. And so, uh, Father, it is called the Word of God. It is your Word, and therefore we ought to pay more careful heed to it than to any other book that we read, to any other source of knowledge. And Father, we pray that we not only pay careful heed to it, but that you use it uh, to transform us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might love you more and that we might love our neighbors more as well. In Jesus' name, amen. John Piper comments on this passage saying this, and I'd like to read the whole quote that he says about this particular passage. He says, Galatians is God's reminder to you and all Christians that we are in constant danger of false assurances. Satan is continuously at work tempting us to think and to feel that because we use God talk and come to church and pray at mealtimes and avoid gross sins, that we are therefore under God's blessing. But the book of Galatians concerns a group of people called Judaizers who do all those things and are yet under God's curse. None of us should sit easily under the scrutiny of this book. Divine blessing and divine curse are the issue. And the continental divide between the two is not between church people and non-church people, nor is it between those who call Jesus Lord and those who don't. It is between those on the one hand who rely totally on the work of Christ for their salvation, who have been crucified with Christ and now in poverty of spirit live in continuing reliance on the living Christ, and those on the other hand who still trust their own works, who have never really died to self-reliance and whose religious activity, though moral, and maybe even intense, is all an exercise in self-reformation. Paul makes three arguments in this section that are really continuations of the arguments that he's begun in the beginning of the book and that will continue throughout much of this epistle. Three arguments that ought to put to death forever the idea that somehow I am saved by good works or that somehow my salvation is completed by good works or that somehow my sanctification is accomplished by good works. The arguments that Paul makes here ought to put to death forever those ideas. And so this morning, let's take a look at some of those arguments that Paul is making here in this segment of Scripture. First of all, the number one argument is that Christ redeemed us from the curse of God's law. Look again at verses 10 through 14. All who rely on observing the law, that's the Mosaic law. That's the Ten Commandments. Now let me add to you, at this point, there's more than Ten Commandments, right? You understand that. Depending on which rabbi you read, there's a 622 or 623 commandments given in the Pentateuch or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, which is called the law. And so all who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Folks, I'm going to gather that most of you don't even know all 622 commandments. So you failed. Bah, right now, as of, as of this moment, it's time to read. But we'll go on and see how, how miserably we fail. And then we'll have some good news. Okay? Clearly, verse 11, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Notice carefully that in verse 10, it is not because you fail to try the try to do the works of the law it is because you try to do them but can't keep them did you catch that it's not because you try to do them it's because uh, because you don't try to do them it's because you do try to do them you do try to be good but the bottom line is you can't continue to be good good enough you can't keep the law you will fail 
at one point or another, and, and if we're honest with ourselves, multiple points many times. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, Pastor Dean, I'm, I'm really a pretty good person. You just don't know me very well. Well, really, you, you didn't say amen when I said my funeral was a long ways off. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <sighs> For the person who thinks they're a pretty good moral person, let's just look at the popular ten. Those, those that we call the Ten Commandments. Let's take a look at them one by one. And as we do so, what you will see is what Paul is arguing in the first section of this passage, that you are under a curse if you seek to be justified by the law because that's what the law does. It curses us. It condemns us. Commandment number one of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, you may be thinking, well, Pastor Dean, I have no idols in my home. I have never made an idol. I don't have any idols. Well, this doesn't say, actually, this part of this commandment, it doesn't deal with idols. The second commandment deals with idols. This talks about having any God. It's not, not, not necessarily referring to, even if it's a God that you just uh, uh, know about, that you're not to have any God before Jehovah God. And you say, well, I don't. Well, anything, anything that controls your life more than God becomes a God to you. In the New Testament, the New Testament writers make it clear that the love of money and that covetousness are forms of what? Idolatry. Why? Because they begin to call the shots rather than God. And anytime something else is calling the shots, anything, to, anything else is controlling you or directing your life, it has become another God to you. So let me ask you a question. Has pleasure ever been your God? Has pleasure ever directed your activities more than God? And before you say no to that, let me remind you that some people sleep in when there's time changes on Sunday because they stayed up too late on Saturday night watching that movie that they wanted to see. And that prevented them from going to church. And so in a very real way, let me ask you this. Think about this. Did that movie at that time become more important than God? It prevented you from going to church the next morning. And your desire to sleep in became more important than what I believe God's will. You say, is it God's will for me to go to church? Yeah, the Bible says so. It doesn't have to be Grace Bible Church. It can be any good Bible-believing teaching church. Now, not every church is a good Bible-believing teaching church, but there are several in this area. But if you're skipping church because you stayed up too late on a Saturday night to play cards with your friends to go to Disney or Bush Gardens, to watch your favorite TV shows, to Facebook, then I would say that pleasure is controlling your life more than God, and it has become a God to you. Now, it's not just pleasure. How about popularity? Young people oftentimes do things to become popular that, that they wouldn't do for any other reason or in any other circumstance, but they desire to be popular. And so popularity becomes a God to them. It controls their life. And remember, anytime something else is controlling your life other than God, then it has become, in a sense, a God to you. So there's pleasure. There's popularity. What about power? People will do things for power that, that, that violate most of our moral consciences. What about possessions? Have you ever lived for possessions? Things. And finally, what about pesos? Pesos? Yeah, well, if I said dollar, it wouldn't, it wouldn't start with a P. Everything here starts with a P, right? <laughs> Pleasure, popularity, power, possessions, pesos. Has money ever called the shots in your life? You say, no, not for me. Did you pick a college based on the occupation that you would get based on the amount of money that you would earn? Or did you pick a college based on what you really believe God would have you to do? There's, that is something that will step on some toes. Did you take a job that you really believe that God wanted you to have? Or did you take a job because of some other reason? I realize you have to work. I, I, I agree with that. You have to work. And there are many, I believe you can, you can honor the Lord in almost any profession. And we need, we need people a lot of times, good, solid, Christian, dedicated Christian people in a lot of different occupations. The medical field. The legal field, every field, the educational field. But what controlled your interest in that field? What, in a sense, called the shots for you? 
Was it God? Was it really God? Or was it money? And so, if it was money, then really, that has become a God to you. So, how many of you have honestly, don't raise your hand, because <laughs> I don't think any of us can, to be honest. How many of us have at one time or another had some other God before us calling the shots? I know when I was young, it was pleasure. I went to church, but I can tell you this, it was motorcycles and motorcycle racing. I never bowed down to my motorcycle, but I would gladly miss church to go to the races. I just, it was. It was more important to me. And so it became my God. I violated commandment number one. My guess is most of us have at one time or another. Well, that's only one. <laughs> There's nine others. Number two, you shall make no, or you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Here's the one where we actually make something, a statue, an idol, something out of gold, silver, bronze, copper, wood, whatever. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. And so number two is somewhat connected with number one. But again, number one doesn't have to have an image. It's just when something becomes more controlling to you than Jehovah God does, whether it's a false god. Because remember, false gods are false gods. They're no gods at all. So there's no difference between a no god at all that's controlling your life, Molech or Baal or any other false god, Ra, and money or possessions or popularity or something else. And number two says you shouldn't have any type of image that looks like the immortal all-powerful, unseen, unchanging God. Now, have we ever done that? Most of us, probably not. Do we allow for it sometimes? Well, here's something. Let me step on toes twice this morning. I'm doing this on purpose because what we will see is that the law curses us. That's what Paul is saying. The law condemns us. You ought to be getting uncomfortable because we are not as morally good as we think we are. We have all violated just these 10, say nothing about the other 612 or 613 commandments. Have you ever uh, watched a movie where somebody plays the role of God? Haven't they become an image of the unseen, unchangeable, all-powerful God? Would that be a violation of number two? Something to think about. I don't care whether it's George Burns or, 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 or Morgan Freeman. Is that right, Freeman? Did I say that right? Or anybody else. Whenever, whenever something or someone tries to, be, to become God, in a sense, that we make, it, make a God or an image or something like God, it fails. Nothing can compare to God. God is so much higher than we are, so much better, so much more powerful so much above us that any time we make something out to look like God, we have done him an injustice. Right? That's, that's like looking at uh, Albert Einstein and saying, hey, Albert Einstein, Pastor Dean reminds me a lot of you, as far as his intellect goes. <laughs> You've just done Albert Einstein an injustice. <laughs> Or Ravi Zacharias, our pastor, he's as smart as you. You have just done Ravi Zacharias an injustice. You have used something less than, something that doesn't compare to, as something equal to, and it doesn't. And the bottom line is God says, don't do that with me. He didn't prohibit it with, with me or Ravi or Albert, but he did it with himself. And I, So I have a little bit of a problem with people playing God in movies because they will always fail to represent God correctly. And I can't help but wonder, okay, you may not make a big deal out of it, you may say, well, there's some redeeming value in some of those movies I've seen or some of those plays or whatever. But here's, a, are we violating the second commandment? Number three, number three, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, when I grew up, I thought that meant you couldn't cuss using God's name. How many of you thought that? You couldn't say, oh, God, blank. That that was the time when you violated this commandment. Well, actually, it's much more comprehensive and broad than that. 
Here in, in the NIV it says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. The, uh, uh, the NIV doesn't quite convey the meaning, I think, as well in this case, although I like the NIV as, as well as the King James does, which says you're not to use it in vain. In vain means meaninglessly, without meaning. It's not just as a cuss word. In other words, I, I believe, and I think most theologians would agree with this, that if you go around and say, ah, oh God, that's stupid, you just violated that commandment. Because you use God's name flippantly. You use God's name without meaning. And I think what attests to that is the reverence that the Jewish people had for the name of God, so much so that they wouldn't even pronounce it out of fear of violating this commandment. And that to this day, when a Jewish person writes the name, the English name of God, not just Yahweh or Yahweh, but when they write the English name of God, what do they do? They leave the O out and they put G, un uh, underline, D, out, out, of, out of fear of violating this commandment. We've, we've turned it into something less than it really is. We've made it a smaller prohibition than what it really is. And we think that it's only when we cuss that we violate this commandment. No, 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 no. If you ever use the name of God flippantly, you have violated this commandment. How are, how are we doing so far? <laughs> have you violated one? Maybe two? Maybe one and two? Three? Four? And how often? By the way, notice it doesn't say just if you say it. I believe you violate this if you think it. So you hit your thumb with the, with the hammer, and you go, Argh! but you don't say it out loud. You just thought it. <laughs> okay, I'm okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> as long as I don't say it out loud, phew, God won't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> you, have you ever thought it? Wow. Let's look at number four. Remember the Sabbath day. By keeping it holy, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. And I know some of you are thinking, well, hey, I take Sundays off. I've never worked on Sunday, and, and I keep it sacred for the Lord. And oh, 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 oh. Sunday's not the Sabbath, right? Saturday's the Sabbath. Sunday's the Lord's day. The early Christians understood that we are no longer under the, the law, that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that they were free to worship on the Lord's day. How many of you have violated the Sabbath? You say, well, that doesn't count. Yes, it does. It's one of the ten. You say, well, I, I don't go to work. on. Does it say go to work or does it say work? You ever paint your house on Saturday? Here's one for you. You ever cut your grass on Saturday? I have. You have, probably. You violated that commandment. You say, I don't cut the grass. I make the kids do it. <laughs> okay, so you just made your kids disobey one of the Ten Commandments. How do you think God's going to handle that? Because here it says, right, if you look at this, uh, on it you shall do no, not do any work, neither you or your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigners residing in your town. Ladies, have you ever washed dishes on the Sabbath? See, you all thought you were pretty, pretty morally good before you came in today, right? <laughs> now, oh, man. now, if you're thinking, Pastor Dean, not, let's go on. I mean, get to something nicer than this. I, we get the point. I, I want to I just go through this because that's what Paul is saying to these people who thought that somehow they could be justified by the law. Is hey, guys, wake up. You fail miserably. You are not morally righteous. You are not morally good. You do not keep the commandments. And you think you're going to get into heaven because you do. You fail, you fail, you fail, you fail, you fail, you fail, you fail. They'd kick you out of school if we went to school for the Ten Commandments. Right? We fail miserably. And so the law curses us. It condemns us. And in part, that's the purpose of it. Because you don't come to Christ until you realize that you need Christ. You don't need a Savior if you think you're morally good enough to get there on your own. And so the law says, no, you're not. You're not good enough. No, you're not good enough. No, nope, you're not good enough. No, nope, you can't do enough good. No, nope, someday you will fail, and you will probably fail more often than you'll admit to. That's what the law does. Number five, honor, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now look again, look again at this one, just like we looked at, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, because vain is broader than a cuss word. 
Here we have a broader commandment than what, than what oftentimes people think. A lot of times people think uh, we just have to obey our parents. No, it doesn't say obey. It says what? Honor. Honor is broader than obey. Certainly it includes obedience. But honor goes beyond obedience. In fact, Jesus helped us to understand how far honor goes when he talked to the Pharisees who were adults but neglecting the needs of their parents, the financial needs of their parents. Now, these are adult religious leaders who when their parents would come to them for money, they would say to their parents, Corban. That is, it is a gift of God. In other words, hey, mom and dad, I'd like to help you, but everything I have has been given to God for his service. And, you know, I don't want to take something away from God to use on you guys. I mean, as nice as you are, you know, God's a little more important than you guys. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, you violate the commandment of God, the commandments of God for the sake of your traditions. You see, honor means that you as a child, if you, 60 years old, 70 years old, if you've got living parents, you ought to be honoring them by taking care of them. And I can guarantee you a lot of Christians passed the buck on that one. And so you've got families of Christians that that the brother or the sister says to the other brother, you know, I, I'd like to help take care of mom and dad, but, you know, hey, I got a job. I have to work more hours than you. You got more freedom and more flexibility. Ah, so you, you take care of mom and dad, and I'll pray for you. You've just dishonored your parents. You've passed the buck to somebody else. Now, it may be true that they have more flexibility and more freedom. So maybe you can honor your parents by saying to your brother or sister, you know what? You've got more flexibility and freedom. If you would agree, we'll work this out together, if you would agree to take care of mom and dad in your house, then I'll give you some money to help with that. That's what Jesus was teaching, folks, when he condemned the actions of the Pharisees. Paul teaches something very similar in the pastoral epistles when he says in the context of widows that the church shouldn't be bothered with widows that have children or grandchildren or relatives. Some people think, well, that poor old lady, she went to Grace Bible Church all her life. The church ought to take care of her when she gets old. No, what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches her children ought to take care of her, that the church's money ought to be used for other support things, for those who don't have any children or grandchildren or relatives, or for ministry purposes in some other way. But how many Christians pass the buck off to the church? Say, you know, mom and dad go to a church, and the church can help them out. After all, she's tithed there for how many years? They owe it to her. That's, that's dishonoring your parents. Honor. Honor is much more comprehensive than obey. So how are we doing so far? We've only, yeah, terrible, thank you, good. <laughs> An honest evaluation. <laughs> Number six. You shall not murder. Nine. Some of you are doing this. Whew. I haven't done that one. One out of seven. One out of six so far. I'm doing good. Well, you may not have literally killed someone, but unfortunately, Jesus tells us in the New Testament that if you've hated somebody without cause, that you've committed murder in your heart. So I, I, I think Jesus would consider that a violation of this, right? Because they were saying, hey, I don't commit murder. The Pharisees, I don't commit murder. I've never killed anyone. Jesus says, I say that if you are angry at a brother without cause, you've committed murder in your heart already. So I guess, I guess we haven't passed <laughs> even one yet. We're guilty, 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 guilty. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Again, some of you are thinking, I've never committed adultery. Whew, I pass. Well, we've got to go back to Jesus again. What did he say? But I say unto you, Pharisees said they didn't commit adultery. Jesus said, but I say unto you that whosoever looks at a woman to lust after her, the same has committed adultery in his heart already. Every one of you guys are guilty. I just know men well enough to know that you've lusted after somebody. <laughs> you know, let's be honest. You've lusted at some time in your life. You have violated. It doesn't say you had to lust real bad. Okay? <laughs> well, we lusted a little bit. <laughs> Guilty. How many times have you lusted? Guilty, 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 guilty. How many shows have you watched where some girl pops up on that, you know? I, I, 1,000, 1 million years B.C., Raquel Welch, boom. Guilty. Some of the young people don't know who Raquel Welch is. Or 
the movie one, one Million Years B.C., right? We're all guilty, 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 guilty. Thou shalt not steal. Let me ask you a question. If I take only five cents, have I been guilty of stealing? Just five cents? Guilty, right? Over and over again, the law condemns us. Number nine, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Here's another one. We sometimes say, thou shalt not lie. Now, again, false testimony is broader than lying. You say, well, give me an example of that. Okay, somebody tells you something about somebody. You don't know if it's true or not. It may not be true, but you go and say, you repeat that information to somebody else. You have just bore false testimony against that person. We, we call it gossip sometimes. Gossip is a sin too. But bearing false testimony is a sin. It doesn't have to be in the form of a lie. It may be that you, uh, bearing false testimony could be something like moving the boundary stones, for, you know, doing something with, uh, with, with documents, misrepresenting the car that you're selling. You, know, you don't even have to lie in the process. You can just fudge a little bit on something. Well, yeah, it ran really good. The car runs really good, yeah. Uh, most of the time. <laughs> you can just leave out some pertinent information and misrepresent it and bear false testimony in that sense. Number 10. Even if you could do all of the other nine, I think this one gets everyone. Thou shall not, or you shall not, covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor, neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You say, well, Pastor Dean, what is the meaning of covet? Let me just say, I think we've all coveted. <laughs> it doesn't matter to the degree. The point of the matter is we have coveted. And so everyone, everyone has broken this one. And, and as we look at just the 10, again, just the 10, not the other 600 plus commandments that are given in the Old Testament, you ought to be feeling by this time cursed. You ought to be identify, able to identify with verse 10, and all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. If you could obey all ten of these commandments on any one day, it wouldn't be good enough. You get that, right? You would have to obey them every single day of your life. You could never bear false testimony. You could never lust after a woman. You could never hate a brother without cause. You could never have anything take the place of God in your life. You could never dishonor your parents. The moment you do, you violated the law and you're cursed. But, wow, that's not good news. I should have stayed home this morning. <laughs> Here's the good news. By the way, this is what the Judaizers were telling the people of Galatia. They were coming in, hey, Paul forgot to give you the whole story. Yeah, you have to believe in Jesus, but you also have to do good things. You have to obey the law of Moses to be saved. He's putting them back under the curse. He's not bringing them good news. That's why Paul said they're bringing a cursed message. The good news is verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of spirit. By faith, not by the keeping of the law. The Mosaic law was never meant to save anyone. He says that later. It was meant, it was meant to curse us so that we might understand our need for a Savior and so that we might go to the Savior helplessly seeking His forgiveness and His salvation. And so point number one is Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. We're not saved by the law. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. Praise God. If I, if I ended this morning's sermon with that last point and saying you're all guilty, guilty, guilty of these violations and you've done it multiple times, if we're honest with ourselves, you'd walk out of here feeling the weight of the world on your shoulders. Right? I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And it's till you understand the forgiveness of Christ. That's when you're set free from the curse. The second point that Paul makes to these Galatians in regards to the Judaizers' false message of adding good works or obedience to the Mosaic 
law to the gospel is that God's law does not cancel the promises of God made earlier. Look at verses 15 through 18. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant, or we might say contract, that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, that the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise, but God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. So here Paul goes back to the Old Testament promise that God made to Abraham in the book of Genesis. And he, and he says to them, hey, even before the law, 430 years before the law, people were still saved by faith. In this case, it was the promise that was made to Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed and that someday the Christ would inherit the land of Canaan. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. In other words, someday, and we know this will be true, when Christ comes back, that the land of Israel, which was formerly the land of Canaan, will be set free from any foreign power. And Christ will rule and reign there. In fact, the whole earth will be set free. But Jerusalem and Israel will enjoy a favor position among all the nations of the earth. That's what the prophets teach. And that all the nations of the earth will seek to flock to Jerusalem and pay homage to the living Christ who will be ruling and reigning bodily in the temple in Jerusalem as King of kings and Lord of lords. And the land is a part of Jesus' inheritance given to him by God the Father by promise through Abraham. And all this happened before the law. So what Paul is basically saying is, how in the world do you think people were saved then before the law? There are 2,000 years of human history, at least. From the time of Adam to the time of of Moses there's at least 2,000 years of human history what happened to all those people there was no law if the law is what saves us then all those people were lost no Paul is saying a promise was made to Abraham and by faith Abraham believed and it was counted to him the right in other words it's always been by faith it's never been by the law you go to a church that tells you that baptism will help accomplish your salvation leave that church they are preaching a false gospel and a cursed message. Nothing you do can help your salvation. You can't be saved by good works or by the law. You can't stay saved by good works or the law. And anybody who tells you otherwise is doing exactly what the Judaizers were doing here, and they ought to be condemned right along with the Judaizers. What's unfortunate is that some Christians go to the church and they say, well, I know they're off on that point, but hey, they got a good choir. They got a wonderful youth group. I love the preacher. He is so nice. He's much more pastoral than Dean. <laughs> That's why I go there. I know they don't, you know, I know they, they overemphasize baptism and think that it helps with salvation, but I can overlook that. Really? All those other things are, are, are just peripheral issues. This is, this is an essential issue. This is an important, this is the difference between eternal life and eternal death. Because if you die and go to your grave thinking that somehow you have helped merit your salvation, then you are not trusting in Jesus. It's not both and. It's not either or. Paul says it cannot be of faith and of works. Otherwise, faith is no more faith or grace is no more grace. And works is no more works. It's one or the other, folks. It's not a mix. Faith is the opposite of works. Faith is relying on what Jesus did. Works is me trying to do something myself to get there. It's not a combination of the two. And nor does any book of the Bible teach that, including the book of James. James is not teaching that it's faith and works. James is saying true faith produces works. There's a big difference. Big, 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 important difference. And so the seed was a reference to Christ. The promise was the land of Canaan. Jesus will inherit the land of Canaan. But not just the land, he inherits the subjects who come to him in faith, believing. And thus we become recipients of the land as well. And so the promise extends to us by faith, not by the keeping 
of the law. Argument, argument number three. I'm sorry, I didn't keep up here. Argument number three, God's law was never given to save, but to point to the Savior. Look at verses 19 and following. So what then was the purpose of law, right? That's what the, that's what the Galatians are thinking. Well, what was the purpose of the law? I, th- I thought if I obeyed this that God would grant me approval and let me in. What was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions. It was added so that you would know what sin was. Paul said, I wouldn't know what sin was except for the law. How do you know, how do you know you're speeding on Osceola? How do you know that you're speeding on Osceola when you are speeding? Because there's a sign there, right, that says 30 miles an hour. It's ridiculous, but there is a sign. (laughs) It should be 45 at least. But anyways, you know because there's a sign. How do we know that we are sinners? Because there's a sign. God wrote it out for us. And that's the purpose of the law. It helps us to understand that we're sinners because of transgressions. It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. That is Christ. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. It's not at odds with with, uh, faith or with God. Why? Because it goes on, for if the law had been given, if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. So that was pro- what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. In other words, it was never the purpose of the law to save anybody. It was never the purpose of the Ten Commandments to save anybody. It doesn't help you stay saved if you keep the Ten Commandments either. You say, what? I can do whatever I want? No. <laughs> Holy Spirit won't let you. I mean, theoretically, you could do things, and, and, and people do. Christians do sin. So do people that think they're obeying the law, <laughs> right? But if you're truly born again, the Holy Spirit will compel you toward holiness. And it, it is the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life and the submission to the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is my submission to the Holy Spirit of law that helps me to fulfill the royal law of God, which is to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and all my strength, and my neighbor as myself. And when I do that, I will, by doing that, keep all of the other commandments of God. I won't covet my neighbor's wife if I love God supremely and love my neighbor as much as I love myself because I won't want to hurt my neighbor in any way. I won't steal from him because I won't want to hurt my neighbor in any way. I won't use the Lord's name in vain because I don't want to hurt God in any way because I love him with all my heart and my soul and my... So when when we allow the Spirit of God to move us toward holiness and when we submit to that... We, by virtue of doing that, begin to obey all the moral requirements of the law. But not because we try to keep them to be saved or to keep them to be holy, but because the Holy Spirit works in us, bringing it about rather than self-reformation. Verse 23, before the faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. Every night I went to bed as a young person before I was saved. I believed in God, I went to church, but I thought that what I did would help get me to heaven. And I knew, I knew I wasn't doing very good at it. And so I went to bed afraid every night. I've shared that with you before, and I know many others that have the same kind of testimony because they think that their goodness will get them there, and yet they know deep in their hearts they're not good enough. No one is, no one ever can be, no one ever will be. Only Christ was. And so there is the fear of death when you're trusting in yourself. And it keeps you prisoner, locked up as a prisoner. But the night that I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, that night when I heard the gospel in the church that I grew up in, because a singing group came, not because the pastor gave the gospel, but because the singing group gave the gospel. I never heard the pastor give the gospel. But a singing group did. And that night when I trusted Christ as my Savior, I felt freedom. Freedom from the burden of my sins. And as I read through this passage, I think of the words of that that speech that was delivered by Martin Luther King in Washington, D.C. in 1963. He applied it to civil rights, but I often apply it to the spiritual freedom in Christ. When he said, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. We are free from the curse of the law because of what Jesus did. 
there's freedom. I don't base my salvation on that feeling. I base my salvation on the Word of God. But when you understand what the Word of God says, there is a sense of freedom that comes over you. Not freedom to be sinful. Not freedom uh, to disobey God. But a freedom from the guilt and the penalty and the power of sin that allows me to live for God. In the 16th century, there was another Martin Luther. He was a reformer, a German reformer, a Catholic priest and teacher who, under Catholicism, continually felt that he was in bondage to the law and, and never felt at ease with the Lord until, after studying the book of Romans and teaching on it, he came across that passage which says the same thing that's repeated here in Galatians, that the just shall live by faith. And all of a sudden, a light went on in Martin Luther's mind. And at that moment, he came to Christ, and here's what he writes. Listen to this. At last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered into paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. Have you ever had that kind of experience? Where the weight of your sin has been lifted off of you? where the guilty, 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 guiltiness that you feel because of your failure to keep the law of God has been lifted from you? It's like walking into paradise. And it comes when you put your trust in your faith and your reliance totally, not in yourselves, but in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins and paid the penalty so that you could be set free free indeed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that if there's anybody here